Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to The Global Current. I'm Jillian Lope. And I'm Alexander Gray. Today in news, Russia sends its aircraft carrier and several other ships to Syria. South Africa's withdrawal from the International Criminal Court. And Filipino senator requests a criminal investigation against President Rodrigo Duterte. In analysis, NATO struggles to cope with the changing geopolitical attitudes. And Belgium blocks trade deal between the European Union and Canada. Then, The Global Current brings you an interview with Barbara Lewis McCarthy, the creator of a scholarship fund for Guatemalan school children. And now, Jacob Abel brings us a report on Russia's deployment of its aircraft carrier to Syria. On October 21, 2016, a Russian aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kutsanov, was spotted off the coast of England along with eight other Russian vessels. The carrier was escorted by two British warships as it passed by the country on its way to Syria to help in the offensive against the rebel-held town of Aleppo. The BBC reports that a tugboat was also seen with the group of Russian vessels. This is most likely due to the fact that the carrier has had mechanical issues in the past. The Kuznetsov can carry up to 50 aircraft, including helicopters. The route the carrier took through the English Channel is not a normal one, and many experts are saying that the Russians are trying to send a clear message to the West that they are ready to flex their military muscle anywhere in the world. The movement of the ships to Syria already has many Western officials worried. The Secretary General of NATO was quoted saying, We are concerned that the Russian carrier group will support military operations in Syria in ways which will increase humanitarian and human suffering. The New York Times reports that the carrier is holding 15 planes to augment those already on the ground in Syria. In Aleppo, there currently exists a ceasefire intended to evacuate civilians before the fighting between the Russian and Syrian militaries resumes. This deployment seems to be part of a larger Russian commitment to Syria. The Washington Post reports that the Russians plan to make the port of Tardis a permanent naval base. All these actions come after a U EU summit which questioned Russian involvement in Syria and whether sanctions should continue. Many leaders, including British Prime Minister Theresa May, French President Francois Hollande, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel, called for the punishment of Russia if it continues military action in Aleppo. We must continue to work together, and it's vital that we work together, to continue to put pressure on Russia. La Russie, uh, Russia would be exposed, if it continues its bombings, to measures from the EU. I hope that we, as the European Council, are in the position to clearly state that what's happening in Syria with Russian support is completely inhumane and against the people who live in Aleppo. According to the national interest, the ship is also carrying some of Russia's brand new MiG-29K Fulcrum fighters. The Russians have been called out in the past for using their Syria operations as an advertisement campaign for their newest weapons. The aircraft carrier increases Russia's power in Syria while simultaneously demonstrating Russia's worldwide influence. This is Jacob Abel reporting for The Global Current. Up next, Mallory Finch reports on South Africa's decision to leave the International Criminal Court. On October 21, 2016, South African diplomats told the UN that South Africa will withdraw from the International Criminal Court, also known as the ICC. Burundi had withdrawn already on October 18, according to The Point. South Africa is following suit. The process will take about a year, and the final decision must go through South Africans' parliament. The South African Justice Minister, Michael Musafi, explained during a press conference. The withdrawal will take effect one year after the Secretary General has received the notification. This withdrawal comes right after South Africa refused to turn in the Sudanese president. In 2015, he was visiting South Africa and the ICC called for the arrest of the president. The ICC cannot arrest individuals, but the countries in the ICC are responsible for carrying out the legal regulations. According to Sputnik News, South Africa has triggered the formal process of leaving the International Criminal Court on the claims that the Hog Base Court was biased against African nations. According to NPR, all of the people who have been tried by the ICC have been from African countries. Now currently, eight out of the nine countries that the ICC investigates are African nations. Kenya, Ivory Coast, Libya, Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic twice, Uganda, Mali, and most recently, Georgia. A few days later, Gambia decided to withdraw from the ICC as well. Kenya also initiated the process. 
Gambia's Minister Sheriff Bojang said, This infamous Caucasian court for the persecution of Africans, and especially their leaders, showed its true colors when it declared that immediately after the ICC released their investigation report on the Iraq war, these nations withdrawn from the ICC are a huge setback in what the ICC has wanted. In the next few weeks, we will see what the future holds for all of the ICC members. For The Global Current, this is Mallory Finch. Next this morning, Ian Fouché reports on a Filipino senator's request for a criminal investigation into alleged crimes ordered by President Rodrigo Duterte. Senator Leila de Lima, a leading member of the Philippine Senate, has asked for a criminal investigation in Rodrigo Duterte in an attempt to put an end to a violent, harsh campaign against drugs that has overseen the death of more than 3,800 individuals since June of this year, according to The Guardian. Formerly a justice secretary, as well as an active human rights advocate, de Lima has stated that foreign intervention was her only hope of ending, quote, state-inspired extrajudicial killings since Duterte took office only four short months ago. De Lima urged world leaders to consider sanctions, even calling for the International Criminal Court in The Hog to undertake an investigation into President Duterte and government officials employed by him. Quote, the ICC should start to think about investigating already or doing an inquiry into the killings as crimes against humanity, end quote, De Lima said in an interview. De Lima has stated that she fears for her own life and safety following an ousting last month as chair of an inquiry investigating the vigilante death squads that are targeting and killing drug dealers and users alike. Her address and mobile number were made public, most likely in an attempt to coerce her to stop the inquiry. For a few weeks after that, I was unable to go home. I slept in other places, although I was able to sneak into my house from time to time, so I felt like a thief in the night in my own home, she commented. The most unfortunate thing is that ever since they publicized my cell phone number, I did receive a lot, almost 2,000 of hate messages and death threats. De Lima has been identified as a political nemesis of President Duterte, whose political authority was solidified on a mandate to enforce a zero-tolerance policy on narcotics usage and distribution. While Duterte denies any official links to unsanctioned extrajudicial murder, his critics claim that his inflammatory speech has directly contributed to a massive surge in violence. In a press conference recorded by The Guardian, President Rodrigo Duterte likened his policies to those of Nazi Germany during the Holocaust. Hitler massacred three million Jews. Now, there is three million, there's a three million drug addict. There are. I'd be happy to slaughter him. At least, if Germany had Hitler, the Philippines would have, but, you know, my victims, I would like to be all criminals to finish the problem of my country and save the next generation from perdition. The president has labeled innocent and child victims of the extrajudicial killings as collateral damage. The youngest victim so far is Danica May, a five-year-old shot in the back of the neck by a masked gunman targeting her grandfather. De Lima, a prominent lawyer and human rights activist, is President Duterte's most outspoken and high-profile opponent. Her calls for international assistance follow her own efforts to expose what she identifies as the truth of the aggressive, unsolicited crackdown of drugs in the Philippines. Her solitary campaign to launch inquiries and hearings awarded her with many authoritative enemies in addition to the president, who has told her to resign and then hang herself. The peak of the hostility between Duterte and De Lima came in September when De Lima invited self-professed hitman Edgar Mataboto to testify in court. Mataboto claimed that Duterte had once shot a Justice Department official and ordered the killing of criminals and political adversaries while serving as the mayor of Davao City in the southern region of the Philippines. For The Global Current, this is Ian Fouché. Next up, Jack Forge analyzes the ongoing debate over NATO's role in the world. For the past several months, the purpose and necessity of NATO has come into question through the statements of many prominent politicians across Europe and the United States. Particularly, there have been many calls to cut funding to NATO and void the commitment to automatically defend NATO allies when attacked. However, the NATO alliance still remains to be the strongest alliance in world history and serves as the global deterrent to aggression throughout the world. According to the NATO website, the three main concepts of the alliance are collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. Collective defense primarily consists of invoking Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which promises that NATO members will always assist each other in time of an attack. Article 5 has only been invoked once, following the September 11th attacks. Crisis management is also a very critical purpose of NATO, as the alliance seeks to provide stability in post-conflict situations. An example of this would be the concerted effort by NATO allies to create a stable society following the invasion of Iraq. 
Finally, NATO contributes to cooperative security around the world by looking to reduce conflict by means of partnership with relevant countries and by contributing to arms control. Former Prime Minister David Cameron addressed the purpose of NATO and the issues NATO faces in the world today at a NATO summit in 2014. We meet at a crucial time in the history of our alliance. The world faces many dangerous and evolving threats, and it is absolutely clear that NATO is as vital to our future as it has been in our past. Russian troops are illegally in Ukraine. The extremist Islamist threat has risen in a new form in Iraq and Syria. These are just two of the threats that we face. NATO is the anchor of our security. It can be stated that the questions of NATO's relevance and effectiveness in today's world are rooted in a misconception of what NATO actually is. The Pew Research Polling Center conducted its latest poll in the spring of 2015, in which only 49% of Americans had a favorable view of NATO. If society reaches the collective conclusion that NATO is obsolete based off of a lack of knowledge as to what NATO actually is, national security is placed at risk and the greatest security threats are automatically enlarged. One of the biggest threats that the Western world faces today is global terrorism. Americans and Europeans alike have suffered from brutal terrorist attacks and have adamantly called for action against the terrorist groups committing these atrocities. NATO provides America and Europe with the best solution to this growing problem. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg outlined NATO's defense strategy this past Wednesday. Collective defense uh, remains the alliance's highest uh, responsibility. And at our summit in Warsaw in July, we took decisions to strengthen our ability to defend allies against any threat from any direction. NATO proposes that the most effective ways to combat global terrorism are coalition building, military training, and a sharing of intelligence. When NATO forces intervened in Afghanistan in 2003, they took command of the UN International Security Assistance Force, which mobilized more than 50 nations to fight al-Qaeda and the Taliban. This collective action had a deep effect on both groups and prevented them from re-emerging as relatively prominent threats. In the event of military action, NATO provides a strong foundation for member nations to conduct a collective strategic use of force. According to the Wall Street Journal, NATO trainers built the Afghan army to 350,000 military personnel who are now responsible for Afghanistan security. In a similar vein, NATO forces are currently training hundreds of Iraqi officers to protect their own borders. This alliance has specifically deployed a team to Baghdad to provide strategic advice and support to the Iraqi security forces. NATO also stands ready to help Libya unify its forces to restabilize the country and combat the Islamic State. Further, NATO controls a large intelligence sharing ring among members of the alliance. The Wall Street Journal reports that just recently NATO approved its first intelligence chief, a position designed to help the alliance improve information sharing and counterterrorism coordination. NATO also has an initiative named Project Stability operating in North Africa and the Middle East that uses NATO's advanced surveillance aircraft to provide valuable information directly to coalition forces. The bottom line is that NATO is one of the best counterterrorism operations that the Western governments have at their disposal today. Terrorist groups such as al-Qaeda and ISIS have waged war against the Western world, and the best move for the Western world is to align together as a unified, concrete force to defeat the threat of terrorism. This is Jack LaForge reporting for The Global Current. And now, Alexandra Prestamo examines the rejection of a proposed free trade agreement between the European Union and Canada. The CETA trade deal between the European Union and Canada has been facing some difficulties only days before the signing of the agreement was supposed to occur. In order to be enacted, the agreement was supposed to be signed by all 28 EU members. However, only 27 of them approved the deal. Belgium was the only one that did not sign it due to the objections of its Wallonia region. The Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, also known as CETA, would have linked the EU market of 500 million people to Canada. CETA negotiations started in 2009 with the goal of eliminating 98% of tariffs and increasing trade between the two partners by 20%. This deal has been highly supported by the Liberal Canadians as it would have greatly boosted the country's economy. The small French-speaking Belgian region of Wallonia had such a powerful impact on the outcome of the trade agreement mainly due to the input of Belgium's constitution. In fact, it stipulates that before the government can sign the deal, each of its regional governments must agree to it. Wallonia Premier Paul Mignet had said, 
him. I clearly said we have to follow the benchmarks that were set by my parliament, and I told that to the European Commission one year ago. It turns out that the Parliament of Wallonia has the same powers as all the other national parliaments in the EU. If we don't sign it, we don't ratify the treaty. It will never come to fruition. However, the motives behind Wallonia's decision are more centered towards internal politics rather than the details of the agreement itself. Wallonia has said that the deal would weaken legal, environmental, and health standards of the region, threatening its farmers and giving too much power to multinational organizations and other governments. Evidently, many of Wallonia's inhabitants strongly support these ideas. In Europe, the laws for the consumers are very strong. We have high standards for environment. We have high standards for social and public services. We have high standards of labor. Uh, this could be decided somewhere else, with multinationals, with lobbies. Wallonia's position has also been described as an anti-globalization response to the problems Europe is facing now, with high levels of unemployment, especially among youth. In fact, despite the environmental, social, and labor motives that it claims, Wallonia is also an economically unstable area. International trade expert Dan Syriac has explained that one of the main factors behind a recession is trade, thus the long period of slow, jobless growth in the region yielded a natural reaction against globalization. But what does Wallonia's decision mean for future European negotiations? Even if the agreement will be reached in the future, the credibility of the EU as the world's largest trading bloc has been damaged by the political ostentation of the Walloon parliament. This disappointment has been evident in Canada's international trade minister's reaction to the situation, where she stated, The European Union is incapable of reaching an agreement, even with a country with European values such as Canada, even with a country as nice and patient as Canada. Therefore, questions about whether the EU can manage to agree on another major trade deal has been raised, especially considering the many demonstrations against the transatlantic trade and investment partnership have been highly visible in several European countries. Also, many have questioned that if this agreement cannot be ratified with Canada, whether it will be less likely to see a European consensus on more difficult issues, such as negotiations concerning Brexit. In these difficult times for the EU, the world will have to wait for the final verdict on this agreement and the future of the EU as a whole. This is Liam Scollins reading for Alexander Prashtano. Finally this morning, The Global Current interviews Barbara Lewis McCarthy, the creator of a scholarship fund for Guatemalan school children. Good morning, Global Current listeners. This is Emily Lividay. I am sitting here with Barbara McCarty of the Zacapa School Aid. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Thank you very much. I know you've done a lot of work with children in Guatemala, so I just want to know what first led you to go into Guatemala. Well, I first was invited to go on a Habitat trip to, with the Global Village Program with Habitat for Humanity to a place called Culatan in Guatemala. And we went there for a week and helped build a house for a family. And then after that, I got hooked and have been going back ever since. That was in 2008. So this will be next one will be my ninth trip there. What was it that made you most want to go back again? Um, the people. The yeah. people are fantastic. They have very little in comparison with what American people have. They you know, go to school in bare feet, some of them. They're living in houses that are substandard, that are basically no more than shacks and yet they're still happy and smiling and welcoming and, you know, they're, they're really great people. Um, so what's like the procedure for building houses in Guatemala? What happens once people get their homes? Um, yeah, how do they pay it back? Well, the Habitat program, um, you have to have land first before you can get a home. So a lot of people in Guatemala don't have land since the Civil War. The titles for the land were destroyed and so there's fighting about getting land. So the way Habitat got around that is by buying fields and then forming colonies. So they uh, purchase a plot of land and then they put in facilities such as sewage and water and electricity. And then after they've done that much, then they start to build houses. And people can apply to have a house, uh, to, to get a Habitat house. In order to do that, they must have a job and they must be able to pay back a loan. They get a zero to two percent interest loan. and it's for 12 years, and that will cover the cost of the house. The house generally is roughly, in American money, it would be about $5,000 to build a house. And these are two-bedroom concrete block, cinder block houses that are reinforced with rebar so that they can stand up to hurricanes and earthquakes, which they have frequently in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. um, 
So what is their living situation like before Habitat Humanity comes in to build them their homes? There's a lot of overcrowding. There's a lot of people paying the landlords high rent because they don't have their own land so they can't build a home. There's um, people living in houses that are built from blocks made with straw and mud and then corrugated iron as the roofing material. Um, in Guatemala they have hurricanes and earthquakes so those houses do not stand up very well. And there's frequently people, um, they have a lot of flash flooding as well, especially in the area where we go, Zacapa, which is a very dry, hot area. And when they do have a hurricane and they have a lot of rain, they can't handle it and the houses often get washed away or you get big sinkholes opening up in the middle of the street and things like that. Um, so what are some success stories that you've seen as you've been going back into Guatemala? Well, probably the biggest success story is a woman named Evelyn, who herself and her husband, Jorge, they have two children, two daughters, and we built for them in 2011, no, 2012, I think. And we go back to the same colony for the, we've been back there for the last five years. Evelyn is now going to college. She has, um, she was working full time, but she has quit her job and she's now going to college in Guatemala City, which is about a four hour drive away from where she lives. Her husband has a job with the municipality, which is reliable work, it's steady work, so they were able to have her quit her job and go back to school. So that's probably the biggest success story. Also, Evelyn is the same woman who, last year when we went, she stopped, she was riding her moped up the street and she saw us and she came running over to see us. And then she insisted that we come and look at her house to see how it was now. It's been four years since we built there. And she had just gotten a tiled floor put into the house because the houses are generally we leave the houses with just bare, bare concrete floor when we're done so she had just had tiles i thought they were only in like a week because they were shiny you could see your face in the tiles but she'd had the tiles in for nine months and she mops the tiles three times a day every day but she was so proud of the tiles she, she came over and she was like pointed them do you like them you know and her she has no english and my spanish is poor mm -hmm. but it was definitely so obvious that she was such so proud of our house, you know, so proud. And she was showing us how they had put in new curtains and the, all the little things that she had done to the house since we've been there the previous year. You know. So that's really nice. It's especially nice that we go, right now we're going to a colony, so this is my fifth year going, and we go back and we see what we consider our families there, the ones we've built for, so I now have four other families there. And they're so proud of their homes and they work so hard to keep them clean and to buy new furniture and, you know, do whatever they can to make them look nice. So. Uh, what is life like for the children that are there? And why do they most need money to be able to go to school? Um, well, the average child in Guatemala goes to school for between four and six years only. Mm -hmm. The government uh, provides education up until the children are 11. And once they turn 12, they have to pay to go to high school or secondary school. And by our standards, it's very, very cheap. It's worth, it's about $5 a month, American dollars. But for them, that's actually an awful lot of money because a lot of people will be making $3 a day or less, depending on what they're doing. The family we built for last time was a single mom with two sons. She worked in a melon packing plant and she worked 16 hour shifts and made $3.50 a day. So if you're only making that much every day, then $5 a month is a lot of money to pay for school. Mm -hmm. uh, her son turns 12 this summer and she was upset. She was trying to explain to me why he was going to have to drop out of school because she didn't have the money. So then when we came back, um, I decided to try and set up a fund fundraising site, first of all, to raise funds. It's like $5 a month will keep a child in school. So it's, we've been, we um, actually made it a registered organization. So it's called Zacapa School Aid. And we have, right now, we have the GoFundMe site, and we have the a Facebook page, and I'm in process of putting a website together, which will hopefully be up in the next month or so. So when I came back from um, Guatemala this time, I decided to set up a fundraising site, a GoFundMe page for Zacapa School Aid, which was going to raise funds to help these families pay for school. Um, we decided then to register it as a nonprofit organization, which we've done um, since March, and so far we've raised about $3,000. But, which doesn't sound like a lot in American terms, but it will keep a class of kids in school. So, 
So what I'm trying to do is set up so that people would donate $5 a month and just have it automatically deducted from their bank account and go to use the Kappa School Aid. And that way we could keep, you know, maybe sponsor, it'd be like sponsoring a child and we could keep a child in school for a year. Um, so what are some of the jobs that kids are doing when they're not in school? What's, what's making them drop out? Uh, well, what's making them drop out is that their families don't have the money to pay for school. Once they leave school, um, the majority of young children would either be working in the fields, picking, they grow a lot of melons there, and they also grow avocados and tomatoes and bananas and pineapples. So they would mostly be working in, in agriculture. Um, if they're in the city, they would be shoeshine boys, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, there really there's, there's not a lot of jobs in the area where we are. Um, there's some service industry jobs, but there's only two hotels in the town where we stay. So do you and think education would help with getting more jobs to that town? Um, well, I think education would help, yeah, definitely with, with anything in life. Mm -hmm. you know. But I think if they, educate, if they have education, they can get a job as a teacher or they can get a job working with the municipality. Um, but without education, they really can't do anything more than manual labor. So they'll never accumulate any wealth. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so you're, when are you going back and what are you expecting to see? Okay, we're going back on March 4th to the 12th. Um, it'll be our final year in the colony that we've been working on for the past five years. So mm -hmm. they're building a hundred houses there and we're into the 90s now. So we'll be building one of the last houses to be built there. Um, right now I'm still recruiting actually for people if they want to come with us and <laughs> still recruit. Um, we will go back. The, house that we built last year we had to leave before the roof was put on we didn't have enough time to finish that so when we go back the roof is on and the family are in living in the house so that would be nice to go back and see and then we'll also go back and visit the other families that we've worked in through the years um, what are some of the biggest improvements that you've seen since you first went eight years ago to now when we first went, the first colony I worked on was is, um, really, really poor and they were all living in these little shacks that had just wood and straw blocks keeping them up. They had big cracks down the middle of the walls from the previous earthquake um, and they were just, you know, terrible living conditions. The children didn't have shoes, some of them had flip-flops, that would be the most they had. They were working on the building site, the men were working on the building site in flip-flops, which, you know, working with concrete blocks and stuff like that is really not yeah. safe at all. So now this uh, habitat I've learned from the issues that we've had in previous colonies. So this time they have, they put in all the supplies first. So they built the roads, they put in the sewers and the water and the power before we even started building houses. So now this is basically like a little village that's ready to go already. Um, everything is up and running. We had um, one of the people that went on a habitat trip with me a couple of years ago, she organized, she lives in California, and she organized with the Rotary Club there. They raised funds to put in a playground in the colony. So there's now a playground there. They opened that last year when we were there. So that's really good for the kids because before that, you know, it was just dirt. Um, and then they've also started a community garden. So they have uh, one patch of ground that they have set out aside that there's no house on and they've started planting. There's trees grow really well there. Like, uh, Papaya trees are really popular there and they grow super fast. So they have planted trees all around the edges and then they're planting vegetables like corn and uh, beans and stuff in the, in the main part. So that's really good for them. It's incre you know, improving their nutrition. It's giving the kids something to do when they're outside of school to go and work mm -hmm. and play on the playground. You know? um, so compared to what we had the first time, it's, you know, it's, it's much, much better. So Habitat have already, they've been in Guatemala since the uh, 70s. It's the first foreign country that Habitat went to. And so far they've built almost 75,000 homes in Guatemala alone. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so we were there, they, they, they're, they're um, increasing the speed as well because the first time I went they had just built the 25,000 one. And then four years later they were up to the 50,000 house. And now we're co coming up to 75,000. So they're building much more quickly now. They have sort of got their routine down and they know exactly what they need and how long it takes, that sort of thing. But there is a, a short housing shortage of almost a million homes in Guatemala, so they still have a long way to There's have. a lot of work to do still. Yeah. Um, so you're finishing up this last colony, so what are the, where do you think you'll be going next after this? 
Um, I'm not sure exactly, actually. We should find out this year when we go back where they were mm -hmm. looking for more land to purchase, so where they purchased the land. Hopefully we'll still say, stay in the Zacapa region because I would like to be able to go back and see mm -hmm. the previous families that I've worked with. Right. Do you guys always follow up with them? Yes, we do. We stay in touch and, and a lot of them have now have, the ones that are working now have mobile phones and they're on Facebook. So we have lots of Facebook friends in Guatemala that we keep up with. That's awesome. Um, so what are some things that people in the United States, if they don't have the time or the money to be able to go to Guatemala, what can they do to support the people of Zacapa? Well, one of the things they could do is support the Zacapa School Aid Foundation, which for $5 a month you can keep a child in school. Mm -hmm. um, instead of getting four to six years of education, we're hoping to get them all the way through high school, and so that maybe like Evelyn, they can end up going to college when they're older. All right, well, there you have it, a very wonderful and worthy cause making a huge difference in Zacapa. I was here with Barbara McCarty of the Zacapa, Zacapa School Aid and this is Emily Livaday for The Global Current. The Global Current is brought to you by the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. Our executive producer is Liam Scollins, our associate producer is Morgan Mount, our news editor is John Trudell, our analysis editor is Melissa Hutton, our technical producer is Trevor West, and our interview segment is produced by Emily Livaday. The Global Current theme song is Acid Jazz by Kevin McLeod. You've been listening to The Global Current on WSOU at 9.5 FM, Seton Hall's Pirate Radio.